Hi. Does that work? Am I in the right place? Yes. Is that good? Okay. Um, so I just quickly want to thank you, Nicholas, for putting this symposium together and to Katie for putting up with me. Um, and she knows what I mean. Um, <laughs> And, um, and also just to say that I'm really happy to be part of this, um, and I was going to say sort of vapidly, you know, to be part of this conversation that's ongoing, but already just from the talks that have happened, it's making me think of my paper in new ways, um, and so I'm excited about sort of all the, all the ideas that are coming at me. Um, all right, I have to use this thing. Artists from across the political spectrum have been drawn to craft as a way to respond to the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. In this paper, I'll begin to outline why craft is, for many, a suitable form of response. What value does craft have as a response to war? By craft, I mean a version or a subset of art, or perhaps more accurately, the making of objects with attention to how they look that has become associated with certain materials and ways of making. So I'm, I'm not using the kind of expanded notion of craft that people have been discussing today. I'm still talking about craft in the sense of textiles, such as the quilts you see here, ceramics, glass, jewelry, metal smithing, woodwork. Um, and in the sense that these, I'm also talking about um, craft in the sense that these materials are worked by hand to produce one of a kind, not mass produced objects. I'll consider a range of examples from work by people who don't identify as artists to artists who don't identify as firmly engaged within a craft discourse. I'll focus in particular on one of these latter examples, an installation by the conceptual artist Michael Rakowitz, which points both to the limitations and yield of holding on to the handmade as a response to war. But first, I'm showing you two examples of responses to get us started. On the left is a quilt pieced by Melissa Cryer, who posted it on the Quilts of Valor Facebook page just before it was mailed to Afghanistan. Quilts of Valor is a foundation begun in 2003 by Catherine Roberts, whose son Nathaniel was deployed in Iraq, with the aim of covering, quote, all combat service members and veterans touched by war with comforting and healing quilts. On the right is Sherry Wood's prayer banner, Repent, a project conceived in 2003 to mourn the, quote, American and allied soldiers and Iraqi civilians who have died in the Iraq war. Each piece of this banner is a scrap of clothing cut in the shape of a coffin and embroidered with the name of a dead soldier or civilian. Like Roberts, Wood saw sewing as a way to bring people together in response to the war in Iraq. The banners, two are still in progress are the handiwork of sewing circles held at galleries on sidewalks in churches, homes, and schools. Unlike Quilts of Valor's Support the Troops attitude, Wood foregrounds her critical intent with her titles, Repent, Mercy, Glory. She concluded a blog post about the project last year, reporting, quote, someone once told me that while looking at the prayer banners, they thought about all of the time it took to stitch the names and all of the lives lost, the wasted time and wasted lives, lives that should never have been wasted. What is it about craft that makes it seem an appropriate means to address the ravages of warfare? In part, we associate craft with war because historically it was a response born of necessity. Here we might think first of the home front. For example, during World War II, faced with the scarcity of goods, women were called upon to knit for the soldiers. Sweaters, gloves, scarves, even chest protectors. Craft was effective in getting needed warmth to soldiers and also providing psychological comfort, both to the soldiers and the knitters. Craft has also long played a role on the front itself. Carl Spitzweg humorously documented the phenomenon in his 1830 knitting sentinel. The cannoneer staves off boredom even as he keeps his eyes peeled by occupying his hands with his knitting needles. We sense the darker side of soldiers tinkering when confronted with this installation of First World War cartridges and shrapnel obsessively embossed and converted into decorative vases, picture frames, memorializing spoons. No doubt, the painstaking handiwork was a welcome distraction, something to help keep sane in the trenches. 
As these examples suggest, Kraft's necessity during wartime has had to do not only with physical, but also psychic survival. Kraft has therapeutic value. The quilts of valor recall a long tradition of women on the home front doing their part to contribute to the war effort, but in this case, the literal necessity has given way to the purely therapeutic. The quilts, lap or twin size, provide the civilian crafters a way to connect with those who've risked their lives for the US. The veterans and wounded receive love and care through a tangible memento. Wood forgoes the gesture to craft as functional object in favor of concentrating on craft as a process of mourning, and I'll discuss in a moment also a mode of critique. Craft is also important quite literally as a form of art therapy. Some of you may have seen, for example, the recent exhibition at the Corcoran featuring work from the Combat Paper Project, which holds workshops for veterans where they convert uniforms into paper, which is then itself a vehicle for images and writing that reflects on veterans' experiences. It's worth noting that all three of these projects, Quilts of Valor, Prayer Banner, Combat Paper Project, seek to engage people with varying political allegiances. Craft has been seen by many as an effective vehicle for critique. And I include here projects such as the Quilts of Valor with its implicit condemnation of anyone perceived as not supporting the troops. Sabrina Gushwander's wartime knitting circle shifts the balance towards a critique of war, but like the Quilts of Valor organizers, she encourages people to participate regardless of their political beliefs. Indeed, both projects are predicated on the notion of craft as a place for people with opposing positions to come together on the basis of what they share. Here we see Gushwander's wartime knitting circle in its 2007 iteration at New York's Museum of Art and Design. In various art venues, Gushwantner has provided the ingredients for a knitting circle equipped with wool, needles, patterns for a number of war-related projects, such as squares to contribute to Afghan for Afghans, and stump socks for war veterans or Iraqi children. People may work on their own projects too, or add a row to a project they find lying underway on the table. Conversations may be prompted by the photo portrait blankets in the background, machine knitted reproductions of photographs having to do with knitters' involvement, critical or otherwise, in war, such as these women who helped create sticky bombs during World War II. The wool coated with adhesive so that the grenades will stick to their targets before exploring, blah, exploding. Gushwantner's installation encourages us to think about how craft lends itself to a response to war, not least because she situates what looks like grassroots activism on the site of the museum and other fine art venues, so that craft is on exhibit as something to be scrutinized. With Gushwantner's help, let's step back and assess these projects, which have a number of things in common, whatever their intent. Perhaps most glaringly in this sample set, we can see that gender is at issue. The one man knitting here just renders the relative gender disparity all the more visible. Admittedly, I've only introduced a few examples to stand in for many, and these mainly feature the fiber arts, although there are also responses, if not as abundant, in all craft media, ceramics, wood. Yet it seems no coincidence that so many people are drawn to the fiber arts, in particular, as a way to respond to war, and that the fiber arts are now in our society associated with the feminine. The contrast between the femininity of knitting and quilting um, and the masculinity of Warcraft feeds into a broader pattern of juxtaposition present in all of these examples. The contrast between the destructive brutality of war and the nurturing domesticity of craft operates both on the home front and the front, whether wielded for purposes of comfort or critique. Gushwantner adds another level of juxtaposition by encouraging a space where knitters can examine what their craft accomplishes in this context. Is their knitting a way to support the troops, to create helmet liners, say, to keep them warm and cared for in the mountains of Afghanistan? Is it a form of consciousness raising to spur the oblivious to remember that the daily lives of other US citizens are not being spent knitting, but rather manning drones, detonating mines, doing messed up things, as one staff sergeant put it in a somewhat, in somewhat fouler language, quote, so I don't do them at home, end quote. Does this knitting activate the knitters to support the troops and or protest the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, or does it release the knitters from the need to do anything but knit? 
Sometimes the war news seems so abstract and it's hard to imagine what it's like for soldiers. Knitting helped make it real to me. Do the tangible materiality of yarn and the slow process of knitting combine to form a real link to the people, soldiers, and civilians confronted by battles taking place on the other side of the globe, or is it a false solace? Gishwander allows for a range of attitudes about how our engagement with craft relates to our imbrication in political life. Rakowitz, another American artist under 40, who unfortunately for my purposes is not in 40 under 40, takes a more explicit stand in his installation, The Invisible Enemy Should Not Exist, Recovered Missing Stolen series, which, like Geschwander's wartime knitting circle, was on view in New York in winter 2007. And actually, I was so pleased because we just saw another installation shot of this at, the, uh, at MAD um, that was a little bit a few years later. So this was the first um, installment. It was in the Second Lives inaugural exhibition. At the center of this installation are about 50 paper mache replicas of antiquities that were looted from Baghdad's National Museum in 2003. With a team of helpers, Rakowitz cobbled together reconstructions of statuettes, reliefs, vases, plates, daggers. Rather than staying true to medium, he made use of Middle Eastern food packaging in newspapers so that the handle of a knife's sheath, for example, announces its former identity as a box containing pasteurized cheese. The makeshift paper mache objects evoke their lost counterpoints parts with surprising efficacy, even though, or rather precisely because, they're inadequate as replacements. Their dinkiness re references the tragedy of the original's disappearance. Provisional as they are, it took a long time to assemble them. Rakowitz estimates an average of eight hours each. Given that about 350 objects have now been produced for this series, which has over the course of the past five years also been exhibited, as I said, always in somewhat different configurations in venues from Chicago to Beirut and New York, they've taken about 2,800 man hours or about 117 days. Rakowitz doubts his team will ever be done. By one count, 10,000 works are still missing. If that seems daunting, think about the hours that went into making the originals. Admittedly, if at first the construction of the replicas seems straightforward, the viewer soon realizes the exacting efforts that went into mimicking metal, stone, and poetry, uh, pottery with mere cardboard, paper, and glue. For instance, the soft alabaster curves, slight asymmetry, and creviced chest of an old Babylonian baboon circa 1800 BC are captured via the manipulation of a Moroccan sardine tin. Our attention to the painstaking labor of Rakowitz and his assistants makes us all the more aware of the skilled craftsmanship whose fruits are, for now, available for public consumption only through photography. The objects are labeled as if they're the artifacts they replace and paired with quotations most called from the archeological community who bemoan the loss of thousands of years of human history. Donald Rumsfeld occasionally also weighs in, his callousness directed sometimes toward cultural patrimony. Who needs all these vases? <laughs> um, which is, there's a more extensive, I'm sure none of you can read that because it looks terrible, but, um, but that's what this um, caption on the left is um, talking about. And then sometimes his um, callousness is directed towards the war's toll on Iraqi lives. The price of freedom, who wouldn't want to pay that price? <laughs> Through these quotations, as well as illustrated stories that accompany the objects, Rakowitz makes clear that he's interested not only in the tragedy that's befallen Iraq's archeological treasures, but also in the war's effects on Iraqi civilians. Now maybe a few of you can read the caption. Um, so indeed with captions such as this, Rumsfeld's, who wouldn't accept this price of getting from a repressed regime to freedom, were directed to start thinking about these objects as surrogates, not just for the missing or destroyed artifacts, but also for human bodies, likewise missing or destroyed. Just as we can't keep track of the numbers of artifacts gone missing, neither can we keep track of the number of Iraqi lives lost since the US entered the country in 2003. Why care more about the destruction of world heritage than the loss of actual human lives? 
Like the other works we've seen, juxtaposition is central to the logic of Rakowitz's operation. The loving intimacy of making, contra of making contrasts with the violence of destruction. But Rakowitz is especially explicit about the failure of craft to make up for the devastation of war. This emphasis on failure may seem to ally Rakowitz more closely with his colleagues working in video than in craft. And we can turn for an example of what I mean to a video that just premiered at 40 Under 40, Kat Mazza's Knit for Defense. For this video, Mazza took film and video footage from World War II, the Vietnam War, and Iraq and Afghanistan, and fed it into a computer program she wrote, which converted the moving images into animated knitting patterns. Analyzing the spectacle of modern warfare through the lens of a knitter's eye, Mazza jams the two arguably antithetical modes into a loop that goes nowhere. The crosshair becomes a decorative motif, but it organizes a pattern that cannot be knit because the target keeps moving. I've been focusing on craft as a response to war, but in the realm of contemporary art, video has arguably been a far more common medium through which to respond to the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Maz's knit for defense places her in a large camp of artists who critique the spectacular virtual nature of current warfare as waged on the part of the US and its allies by investigating the spectacular means of that warfare. Artists who choose to foreground the linking of body to object through the slow procedures of handicraft, on the other hand, do so to lay claim to a counter narrative. This strategy, this strategy may seem naive or overly cynical. Either way, the use of craft to respond to war, whether therapeutically, critically, or practically, may seem unlikely to make any meaningful dent in the military industrial complex of our spectacular age. Rakowitz's invisible enemy points directly to that failure, the impossibility of making up for the destruction wrought on the National Museum and on the human collateral. However, Rakowitz also holds on to the belief that the handmaid has something of value to offer in the face of war. The installation's failure to replace the missing to catalyze major policy shifts is also its success. In its very inadequacy, the handmaid artwork helps us confront, not transcend, not forget, our responsibility as humans for our historical situation. Rakowitz's project serves as a critical alternative to more official attempts to address the adverse effects of the war in Iraq and to establish warm relations between the US and Iraq. In 2009, Google and the State Department announced a plan to create a virtual version of the National Museum in Baghdad. In 2011, it went live. Despite repeated claims that the museum will soon reopen to the public or has reopened, the museum remains closed except for occasional visits by officials and other special guests. What objects are on view in the museum are thus only accessible through Google's Street View technology. And this is a screenshot I took while playing around with it. Admittedly, I'm technologically inept, but th this was actually one of the better shots that I managed to snap. So you can try it on your own and see, maybe I'm being unfair in choosing this picture, but you can do it yourself. Rakowitz's effort comes no closer than Google and the State Department to making the National Museum physically accessible. But it does provide the few who have the chance to encounter these surrogate objects with an embodied connection, as opposed to a virtual connection with the real thing. Rather than attempting to make things right again with sophisticated technology, Rakowitz helps us attend to the scars of history. I want to begin concluding by bringing in one more non-art world craft response to war. Iraqi Bundles of Love was launched in 2009 by Art Laflamme, a US major deployed in Iraq. Laflamme, a son, brother, husband, and father to quilters, was inspired during Ramadan to solicit donations from US quilters and knitters to Iraqis, both to uh, fabric-related businesses or sewing co-ops and to widows and orphans in need. Laflamme would have been content with a few boxes. He received 3,445. He organized two more iterations of these surges before signing off in 2011, happy to be back at home with his family. 
Here are pictures of women and girls in Afghanistan actually showing off clothing made with material from some of the bundles. The Iraqi bundles of love come perhaps closest to returning us to our initial category, necessity. Although one could argue that that begs the question, was it necessary to go to war in the first place? I began this paper with a question, what value does craft have as a response to war? My examples have come mainly from US responses to the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Most of these projects draw on the resources of the internet, bringing together various makers to collaborate on the time-consuming affair of making things by hand. Here are Facebook pages for Iraqi bundles of love and quilts of valor. There's often an emphasis on statistics, man hours spent, quilts sewn, bundles sent, objects replaced. Many of these projects are unfinished or finished only by the accident of circumstance. La Flamme is no longer in Iraq to coordinate Iraqi bundles of love. The work of Quilts of Valor will presumably never be done. It's hard to imagine that there won't, won't always be more veterans to receive quilts. The invisible enemy makes explicit something perhaps implicit in all the examples we've seen, that the devastation wrought by war can never be removed, no matter how many stitches are sewn, pieces quilted, objects cobbled together with glue and ingenuity. Craft's value as a response to war lies rather, I'd suggest, in the way that it can make so manifest its own inadequacy and yet signal an effort to go on trying. Craft is often an ongoing process of attempting to care, to bind people through objects. The attempt may always fail, but it's worth continuing to try. Thank you. Thanks, Bibi. And now we have Maria Shevzov um, speaking uh, about a very, from a very different perspective on craft and war. Um, and then actually, when you're, as soon as you're done, Maria, Bibi, if you can come back up here, and we'll just do questions up here, I think, with the two of you. It's easier. Oh, good afternoon. Um, so I'm excited to uh, share my paper with all of you after the selection we've heard this afternoon because I think that some of the questions that have been raised and some of the points that have been made really um, are addressed in an interesting way by a hobby um, that for a lot of people is much more. Um, when most people, and I, I don't know how much any of you think about reenacting, um, <laughs> but when most people think about reenacting, um, if they think about it at all, images of crafting, DIY, and the slow movement probably seem at odds with pictures of geeky history buffs fighting pretend battles. The idea of mostly grown men wearing the uniforms of the good, the bad, and the ugly is an uncomfortable and even distasteful one for many people. This paper explores the craft of reenactors who have become so intrigued by the making of historically accurate objects that the actual reenacting has become almost secondary. Certainly, the reenactors who take the hobby to the level discussed in my presentation are in the minority, but their approach to authenticity and craft is worth considering for the contribution they make to public perceptions of history. In the ever-changing dialogue on craft in America, there is surely room for one more group <laughs> and something as unexpected as reenactors who use traditional craft as a vehicle for an authentic experience. Oh. Oh, I didn't know what was doing that. Excuse me. So I've been observing this hobby, um, or even more accurately lifestyle, for over 10 years. And my main goal for this paper was to better understand the process and motivation behind making clothing and equipment for reenacting, especially when most reenactors simply buy their costumes. I'll start with a brief overview of the hobby and then use five case studies to examine the role of craft in reenacting. Uh, 
the term reenacting <laughs> includes everything from professional historic interpreters at Colonial Williamsburg to science fiction reenactors. And in this fantastic photo from the web, you can get a sense of the range um, as we see stormtroopers, Civil War soldiers, Ghostbusters, and even Captain Jack Sparrow all together in one shot. So just to be clear, my paper is about hobby reenactors of actual periods of military conflict in American history from the mid 18th century to the 20th century. There are several specialized terms that I'll be using today. Um, first, the hobby is a catch-all for everything related to reenacting. An impression can be a specific person, like at historic sites, but it's also the all-encompassing knowledge involved with historical research, construction, and purchase of objects that build authenticity within the chosen persona. Git is the term that, that collectively describes the clothing and equipment for each impression, and a farb, or farby object, is anything or anyone that is clearly not authentic to the period, and it is used with disdain. So, one could say, if you're serious about the hobby, it's important to build a good impression and not be a farb. And finally, because there are a lot of different terms within the reenacting community to describe different types of reenactors, I've just created my own term, um, intent reenactor, to describe those whose scholarly and focused methodology to making is an essential component of their impression. The intent reenactor has a period appropriate hairstyle and facial hair, removes or covers anachronistic tattoos or piercings, or never gets them at all, and adapts physical comportment to the clothing and mannerisms of the period. This online quiz from Parade Magazine shows just one example in the photo on the left. In this sense, making an impression begins with crafting the body to reflect our current understanding of the period of interest. The clothing, haircut, and equipment have to be accurate to have an authentic experience because the participants know it's not time travel. Scholarship on reenactors typically focuses on the psychological motivations of the participants. Some journalists and scholars have immersed themselves in reenacting in order to write about it, such as Tony Horowitz's bestseller Confederates in the Attic, or more recently, historian Jenny Thompson's War Games about reenacting the World Wars. These works often discuss the detailed building of an impression, but it's usually treated as an eccentricity to be concerned with a specific button, seam, or thread. And yet the level of dedication to detail is what shapes peer groups in the hobby, and it's directly related to the experience and image at events. Among the best attempts at explaining the motivation to reenact is that it is driven by a quest for authenticity, which is achieved in rare glimpses when the participants feel themselves both to be in touch with a real world and with their real selves. That is, they realize that it's 2012 and they're standing on a field dressed in a funny outfit, but they're seeing something that is also real in a, in a very uh, unique way. All of the effort involved in making an impression thus pays off in those instants when the reenactor glimpses a scene when a reenactor glimpses a scene and realizes that what he sees must look almost like what actually happened. Reenactors participate in a broad range of craft, but the largest group of makers are those who use needle, thread, and scissors to shape a persona. While making these objects involves extensive study of actual objects and scholarship, I didn't touch that. <laughs> There is also a strong social component in which crafting accuracy shapes peer groups. Events are as much about exchanging research and admiring recent projects as they are about the actual event. In the case studies that follow, these makers are representative of an approach to reenacting that interprets the past with an impression that is largely built by craft. When he was 14, Wade Rogers' interest in history and making led him to volunteer at a local historic site with a historic trades program. He quickly found a mentor in the site blacksmith and for nearly 10 years serves a, served as an apprentice learning traditional traf, craft techniques for fabric, leather, wood, and metal. His first experience reenacting was for work, which eventually led to 18th century militia, Civil War, and World War I and World War II impressions. 
reenacting provided him with an outlet for understanding and using his increasingly complex projects. One of his earliest projects is this hunting knife, which is based on a photograph of an original published in a, a book of um, various weapons and blade, blade weapons. And, um, but for his version, Rogers repurposed a lawnmower blade and a 50 caliber brass shell casing for the ferrule around the blade base. The antler handle came from a hunting trophy in the family room, which his father evidently no longer wanted. To make this federal frock coat, Rogers referenced Civil War quartermaster specifications and based his coat on examples from the Schuylkill Arsenal, which were made piecework in the local community. Rogers gave two reasons for making his own kit, which were widely echoed during my interviews. The first is that the best quality reproductions are prohibitively expensive. The second reason is that he makes the most accurate uniforms possible and is willing to accept the shortcomings of his own work because he understands them. High quality images from books and auction websites provided the stitch patterns for the quilted chest lining and the piecing in the skirt of the jacket. And this version, like the original, is entirely hand sewn with linen thread that Rogers dyed himself using logwood, as in the period. And the buttonholes are hand stitched with silk thread. This federal style knapsack on the left is based on the original knapsack in Rogers' own collection on the right. Side by side, you can see the result of measurements taken with a micrometer and Rogers' five years experimentation for an acceptable and accurate paint recipe based on Civil War era recipes. From the placement of the copper rivets to the oak tanned leather dyed with iron and logwood, Rogers used his original knapsack as a primary source to inform the reproduction version, which he now uses at events. For his World War I doughboy impression, Rogers wanted an early war style jacket, also called expedient because areas were left unfinished to speed up manufacture for troops being sent to France. He recycled a World War II army blanket and duffel bag for the similar fabric that's readily available. And the buttons and collar tabs he found one by one at antique shops and flea markets. Shown here in his full World War I doughboy kit or impression Wade Rogers pursues his research and making in his free time and commented that the camaraderie of his reenacting community is the major reason he still goes to events. While his bank colleagues find the old man stuff a little weird, reenactors share his excitement. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Reenactors share his excitement over carefully dyed leather and the proper weight of blue wool. Like many intent reenactors, Rogers downplays his reenacting hobby while at work and with people outside the hobby. Some reenactors turn their skill and fascination with details into paid opportunities. In the twi 23 years since Carl Johnson began reenacting, his impressions have included the American Revolution, Napoleonic War, American Civil War, and both sides of World War I and World War II. Johnson's mother made his first regimental coat, but his interest in material culture led to a business supplying military uniforms and equipment based on the most recent sources. Today, in addition to being a licensed architect, Johnson is a military costume technical advisor for film, outfitting reenactors, collectors, museums, and is also a reenextra. A reenextra, um, that's a great term, you know? Reenextras are, um, they're actually routinely used in military film scenes because they often provide their own equipment and they know how to wear it and use it in a way that a regular movie extra probably does not. Rune extras also provide subtle nuances with historically appropriate haircuts, facial hair, and mannerisms. Hollywood blockbusters such as The Patriot, Saving Private Ryan, and Cold, Fount Cold Mountain are just a few examples of rune extras at work. This coat for Johnson's own Royal Welsh Fusiliers impression is a recent project. The colors and materials are based on surviving examples, images, and the Royal Warrant of 1768, which outlined uniform specifications for regiments of the British Crown. In England last winter, Johnson viewed several collections with extant uniforms, equipment, and the 1768 warrant. 
Examining these primary sources firsthand has impacted his approach to some finishing details, but in many ways it confirmed his existing understanding of the materials. The trip also gave Johnson an increased sense of credibility as a maker and scholar of material culture. As for the value of reenacting, Johnson says that during an event he might reenact a battle, but he's also there for education based in history. While well, the regiment, the Royal Welsh Fusiliers, has a museum in England, shown on the right, Johnson's impression puts him in direct contact with the public in the United States. Using needle and thread, he creates clothing to tell the history of battles here, and the web of trade, politics, and craftsmanship involved with placing a uniformed man on a battlefield, such as Lexington Green, where the Royal Welsh Fusiliers were present for the battle in 1775, as seen in this engraving on the lower left. Another recent project is this hat, made for a private military collector. Originally worn by the Army of the First French Republic in the 1790s, Johnson drew on period written description of soldiers. And a number of these hats survive in museum collections and have been sold at auction, providing a range of sources for the reproduction. While Johnson views accuracy as the primary goal of his impression, it's also one that he describes as a constant evolution based on feedback and research. Carl Johnson acknowledges a frustrating range of concessions that have to be made because the appropriate materials are simply not available. For his king's own impression, Johnson based his regimental coat on a surviving example in a museum collection. He stitched the specially, specially woven wool tape around each of the buttonholes and then used pewter buttons that are close, but not identical, to the originals. From sheep breeds to the process of dyeing wool, some concessions simply have to be accepted to move forward with the larger picture of reenacting. If Wade Rogers and Carl Johnson represent one approach to intent reenacting, Laura Rogers, who's married to Wade, offers a different approach that is equally committed to historical accuracy. A passionate costumer, Rogers has been making historically based costumes since she was 16, and she's now responsible for the costumes at a medium sized historic site. In our conversation, Laura Rogers emphasized the difference between civilian and military impressions. For civilians, accurate is a much broader range of style, taste, and materials because there was no one set of regulations that stipulated the details. Because the range of accurate is very different for non-military impressions, Rogers' clothing reflects her knowledge of period taste, fashion, materials, and design, rather than strictly copying extant garments. She made this dress from a $4 per yard cotton print that is comparable to printed fabrics from the period. The pattern is from a well-documented period dress, while the decorative embellishments are her own designs based on print sources, such as Godey's Ladies Book, a favorite source for 19th century fashion. These details show the care and accuracy of Rogers' work, such as fabric covered buttons, and the skirt with its hundreds of, hundreds of tiny cartridge pleats hand sewn to the waistband, and the dark trim that has been stitched on by hand as in the period. Rogers makes everything from hats to shoes, with events often inspiring her to research and construct a new garment or accessory to fit her impression. Laura Rogers also spins yarn, as seen in this image, and is knowledgeable in various fiber arts, but her main interest in reenacting is constantly researching and making historic clothing and being around like-minded people. She does not have a set impression, in part because historically accurate roles for women are limited, and do not usually offer the fantasy and excitement available to men. <laughs> At events, Rogers focuses instead on educating the public about historical clothing and accessories. There are, however, some women who choose to portray men in the field, although each reenacting group has its own policies on where the line of accuracy is drawn. For the 18th and 19th centuries, women's historically accurate roles are primarily service roles, preparing food and cooking over a fire, mending, washing laundry, or depicting a camp follower or even a prostitute. In military reenacting, there are some fascinating and exciting roles for women, but finding them requires creativity, research, and perseverance. 
one intent reenactor who's used her passion for history to create an uncommon female impression is Brenda Hornsby Heindel. She depicts a female telegraph operator during the Civil War. Heindel focused on this impression after volunteering at historic sites in high school. She does make all of her own clothing using reproduction and period appropriate. <laughs> I'm not touching it, this is crazy. You need to stop, you need to simmer down. <laughs> In addition to her Civil War impression, however, Heindel is devoted to the study of American ceramics and is a production potter focusing on historically inspired wares, historic reproductions, and experimental archaeology. This summer, she built and fired a wood-burning kiln on the produce and grain farm that she and her husband operate. Last year, she made her own fully functional telegraph key on board, pictured here. To build this key, Heindel had to learn about current, wiring, voltage, and other essentials of electricity. Understanding these concepts was important for operating and constructing the key, but it's essential for explaining the telegraph at public events. All right now. Using found parts from mostly post-Civil War telegraph keys, it took about three days to construct the machine. Brenda Heindel's single, Signal Corps and Military Telegraph Group focuses on edu educating the public about communication during the Civil War. For Heindel, using these tools to interpret a female telegraph operator is particularly important because it was one of the few fields that was acceptable that early, um, an acceptable profession for women that early in the 19th century. And now we get to this guy. <laughs> Um, Jason Melius began reenacting in the early 1990s with impressions including Revolutionary War and World War II. Within a few years, he was making his own kit with his approach to the hobby evolving from what he calls grown-up G.I. Joe into a more thoughtful methodology that draws heavily on primary accounts and surviving objects. Today, Melius's southeastern woodland Indian impression involves researching native materials and craft techniques. Sources on Atlantic world trade provide essential details on goods exchanged between the English and the American Indians. Melius's dedication to his Indian impression is apparent immediately. His dark hair is worn in a scalp lock with the top long and the sides and back shaved. His arms, legs, and chest display tattoos based on traditional geometric designs and done in the traditional technique. And he has numerous piercings in his nose and ears. This match coat, which Melius is wearing here, is a versatile outer garment and blanket make it made of scarlet colored superfine wool with the edges bound in gold braid and hand sewn using linen thread. Milius based his match coat on this painting of Saga Yeath, a Mohawk Indian who accompanied Sir Francis Nicholson to England in 1710 and on surviving examples. This breechcloth is made from reproduction wool, which was made to Indian specification along the River Stroud in England as early as 1710. In this detail of the breechcloth, you can see the white stripe that was left undyed during manufacture in the 18th century and reproduced the same way today, primarily for reenactors. Also visible in the detail are the silk ribbon and linen thread used to complete the garment. After teaching himself a traditional technique for finger weaving yarn and beads, Milius made this wool and glass bead scalp decoration. His knowledge of southeastern woodland Indian material culture has also led to consulting and making reproductions for reenactors and for organizations like Colonial Williamsburg, which recently introduced its Native American initiative to add to the existing interpretation of the site. Jason Melius' rationale for constantly making and remaking is based on the idea that reenacting at its core serves an educational purpose. But he says you can't teach if your approach is halfway. Using primary sources, academic scholarship, museum collections, and traditional tra craft techniques, all of these intent reenactors have shaped a world of making that expresses the current understanding of the material life of the past. In the process of making these objects slowly and carefully by hand 
for use on weekends removed from most modern conveniences, intent reenactors have made a place where they can at once admire each other's skill with a needle and immerse themselves in the materiality of their obsession. Military reenacting is also a problematic hobby, which raises questions about the ethical and ideological motivation behind playing war for fun. It also raises questions about when the quest for accuracy goes too far. Those questions are their own important discussion, one which is ongoing within the reenacting community. But for today, I hope that this glimpse into the complex world of military reenacting adds another dimension to the conversation on craft in America. In conclusion, the passion for dressing up is very easy to dismiss as immature or eccentric, and it probably is. To some critics, the hobby is simply distasteful, but it's also a hobby that for some becomes a lifestyle of historical research, making, and education. These craftsmen improve the tangible and authentic experience of representing war and American history by making and using functional craft. There are the rare moments when an intent reenactor glimpses a scene that feels authentic. Far more often, however, there is the tangible accomplishment of using the objects to learn and teach about the past. Thank you. Um, well, the, the question was how many Native American reenactors are there? Um, any sort of numbers are, are really difficult to come by because there's no unifying organization. Um, they're a smaller group within the larger reenacting community, but um, within the groups that I know, I, I guess I probably know about five or six who are kind of at this level. Um, so it's definitely a minority. Um, but the people that, that are into native reenacting um, tend to be very serious about it and very devoted. And obviously, if you're going to um, take it to the level where you're piercing and wearing your hair that way all the time, I mean, it, it doesn't appeal to everybody. But they're definitely very active groups representing a lot of different, a lot of different communities. Yeah. What is it that draws them to specific periods of time? How do you decide to become a Civil War reactor or a World War II reactor? The question was how, how do reenactors choose their time period? Um, and especially in the case of reenactors who are interpreting four or five wars. Um, and uh, the answer to that is that nobody has really found a good answer. Um, <laughs> that's one of the things that uh, a lot of the psychological and anthropological papers look at and try to answer. Um, but what is interesting is that there's a, a tendency, um, not all the time, but very often, a reenactor will start with Civil War or Revolutionary War, um, probably because those are the most accessible ways to see the hobby and get involved because those are the things you see being done publicly. And then as the interest in it grows, there's often a tendency to get into some of the periods that aren't necessarily reenacted at public events. So they might be private events where you go for the weekend and it's an immersion experience. Hi. Um, I uh, spent some time in Connecticut and New England, and so I knew some reenactors who were very passionate about what they did, um, reenacting a lot of Civil War um, uh, battles and, and everything. And um, one of the things I was always curious about was how I know that there was, it's always this quest for authenticity and, you know, creating hand stitching, making sure that the fabric is is the right kind of dye that was used. I'm I'm just curious where I mean, because the one woman that used a store purchase yardage yeah. that was in that. At, at what point does that become kind of cheating? And you know, <laughs> well, it 
I mean, that, that's exactly, I guess, the point is that it, it depends on what your impression is, because for something like the, the military impressions for the Revolutionary War, you can't walk into Joanne's fabric and buy wool that's anything like the wool that those uniforms were made out of. So um, you try and find the best source for that wool, um, and if it ends up being $60 a yard or something, um, that's what you get if, if, if that's what's important. But for somebody like Laura, um, I think she was a great example because she has researched so much original clothing and she produces it as costumes for the interpreters at her job. But it's really, um, I think for a lot of reenactors, about becoming familiar with the quality and the visual feel for period objects and then looking for more affordable options today. So like that print could easily have been a print from the 18th century. And so I think, you know, the idea that you would pay $4 for a yard wherever she got it, you know, it, it's still an appropriate fabric. Um, and cheating, I think, depends a lot on how serious you want to be. Um, Laura, for example, doesn't feel it's necessary to use absolutely the most accurate thread on the interior seams of her clothing, whereas Wade was dyeing his thread with logwood so that it was 100% accurate. Yeah, that was my follow-up yeah. question, is, is how many people go to that extent? Because I did know people that would, that would say, no, you have to use this cotton thread that has been dyed you know, with the, the, the indigo crushed by your own hands, or, or right. that kind right. of thing. And yeah. so I'm just wondering, uh, apparently, there is some sort of give and take to that, depending Th on the there, Yeah, there is some give and take. I mean, I, I think it also, you know, for the people that I interviewed, there's also the recognition that it is a hobby and it is something they want to be fun. And so there are some areas where you maybe make a concession with the goal of working towards getting the perfect material if and when it becomes available. But there are some things you simply can't get. Like the, the example of the buttons. I mean, the, the buttons in the period were pewter buttons that were cast all in one piece. Well, you can get custom buttons remade today but, you know, heaven forbid, they're going to have an iron shank on the back. So, like, it can look right on the front, but you still know it's not right. Interesting. Thank you. Sure. I have one more question on this topic. And it looks like the five uh, case studies that you presented are all about, um, since we're talking about nation building, they're all about uh, nationalism in a way. It seems like World War One, World War Two. I wonder if there are any reenactors who decide to choose... Um, the enemy, whether it's uh, uh, Italian, German, Japanese. Oh, yeah. And if in that case, my follow-up question would be, is there a problem with, the, with finding the proper materials, even, you know, if that's even a limitation, even farther so to uh, achieve a, a good result? Oh, well, there are absolutely, I mean, somebody's got to be the bad guy. So there, there absolutely is. And um, for example, the, the Revolutionary War examples I showed, those are British reenactors, so I mean, that, those are the bad guys, you know? <laughs> um, but in terms of some of the more recent conflicts, um, and actually there are reenactors that also do Korean and Vietnam reenacting, um, which is really shocking to a lot of people. Um, but certainly in World War II reenacting and in World War I reenacting, um, there are very strong groups that do um, Russian and Soviet and French and Italian and German. Um, German reenacting, that was, um, you know, the book War Games that I mentioned, a lot of that was talking about German reenactors, and there have been a number of documentaries that have looked at that group um, and tried to kind of understand why a group of people would choose to reenact, you know, the Nazis in the Third Reich. Um, and nobody really has a good answer, but if you're going to reenact, I mean, there are people that choose to reenact all aspects of it. And the materials, um, to answer the second part of your question, uh, some of these things are available um, for World War II. The Axis um, original materials are highly collectible, um, and so you don't typically see those things being made in the field, uh, worn in the field. And instead, there's actually a huge reproduction market that is mass-produced reproduction of um, especially World War II German that is readily available and at all levels of quality and cost. Um. So if there's time for one more. So I actually loved hearing these two papers together because um, it made me think um, Bibi, 
BB of Rakowitz's, you know, the objects that he's creating that were lost are a kind of reenactment, but of course they're a reenactment that's pointing to um, their, the absence or the inability to actually have a reenactment, <laughs> to the fantasy that one can replace it. So I guess my question in this sort of amorphous way is um, a little bit for both of you. One, BB, if you had like some thoughts about that, and then also, um, if you had any thoughts about, or, or, or I guess a question for you about the actual people who do these reenactments, if there are any reenactors who have a kind of um, criticality, like some sort of distance from themselves. I mean, you talk about them all, all like being concerned with education or something like that, but that's a very, uh, I mean, it strikes me as a little bit self-serving. I mean, I guess it's education in some sort of way, but it's not, there's not any, uh, or. or are there different levels, I guess, of criticality, to have a, a more neutral question? But just, BB, if you saw any kind of relationship, you know, to how right, Rakowitz right. does that kind of... Right, I mean, I, I think, I, I was sort of thinking about that even before, is this, is this working? Yeah. Um, I was thinking about that even before uh, we gave the papers, because I knew, I knew that I was going to be talking about Rakowitz's project, and it seems like a kind of reenactment, <coughs> and so I knew that there would be somehow this kind of echo. Um, and I don't know if I have a really good answer for you, except that um, I'm just more that like, I, I think that is this sort of interesting question. I think it brings up like, we've been talking in some of the papers about you know, the role of hobby craft. Um, and for me in my paper, I tried to sort of bring together hobby craft, like a whole range of um, different makers, um, those who are sort of in that hobby craft area, arena, um, and then to Rakowitz, who's very much a conceptual artist doesn't identify at all with craft in any way, um, and yet is clearly um, sort of drawing on handicraft um, in this project and in other projects also. Um, and so for me, it was useful to have Rakowitz as a voice there because I think he was making explicit things that are implicit in this sort of you know draw to craft. And so I wonder. I mean, that was a question that I had about your paper also. That sort of what. You know, what do we learn about this, these reenactments from examining the material quality of it? So like for, you know, in, in my paper, I'm sort of looking at like, there's something about the craft that people who want to think about war, who want to respond to war are drawn to craft because that's giving them something that, that engagement with the materiality and with that history is important to them. And so it's like, these people are also drawn to craft, which is what you're sort of foregrounding and then Right, I mean, I guess also, like, is, is there simply a, um, that we need um, some sort of conceptual artist to come along and do a reenactment, you know, an art, conceptual art piece about reenactment, and then we can sort of, that can be clarified, or is that something that, that, that is there and that we can see? Um, yeah, so I guess it's the same question as Terry's question. Um, <laughs> now you're up again. Wow. Um, I would say a couple of things. For one thing, um, depending on the reenactor you talk to and depending on the period, some will say, it's all about education, this is why I do it. I mean, Brenda, who does the Telegraph, it's, it's definitely educational because her group goes to yeah. public events and they're presenting to people. I mean, so that, that is very much what it is. And at the same time, it is serving a self-interest to, to do that and to show that expertise. Um, for, for some of the others, some of the ones that say, well, we say it's about education, but mostly we just like dressing up. I mean, it, that's certainly an aspect of it. I mean, there is a, a fantasy component where you are removing yourself from modern life and stepping back into something else. And when you're stepping back into that image, you're also wearing these clothes that you have made, and they are as close as they can possibly be in your understanding to what people were wearing. And so in that sense, I think it's a sort of an intimate experience because you're trying to understand more about that personal experience of history. I, mean, I, wonder, I wonder whether another way to get at the question is to think about what are the politics of this reenactment, which you sort of were keeping it some distance from, but I wonder if that engagement with materiality does give us access to the politics in some other way. But I mean, and I, I say this because this responds to some, Nicholas gave us um, the presenters a tour this morning I wasn't going to do this in public, but now I am. Um, but, but you said something about sort of contemporary responses in craft to war um, you think are apolitical. And I may have misunderstood that entirely, but you were sort of saying they're observing things rather than being activists, right? Less polemical, right? Less polemical, I would 
agree with. Um, but so there's sort of like, there is a possibility of thinking of these reenactments as apolitical. They simply enjoy doing this, and this is a fun hobby. But like, of course, everything's political. So then what is the politics of spending all this time recreating these materials so exactly? Like, what is the politics there? Would be uh, that, to. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, an, that's a fabulous question. And I don't, I don't know that anybody has really been able to answer that. Because one of the things, when you look at the scholarship, is that it's academics stepping in um, okay. and trying to unpack. And they're not necessarily reenactors. And so I, it seems like there's always really a distance um, when you have people that aren't participating trying to unpack. Um, and it depends on the period, too, um, because obviously, for many people, there's a huge difference between the Revolutionary War and World War II. Um, so I'm not sure that's a question that I that can really an answer. <laughs> it is a fabulous question. Right yeah. Uh, you have 10 <laughs> so. minutes.